Okay, so uh, great to be with you this morning. And uh, uh, my purpose here actually is to talk to you a little about something I started uh, thinking about a couple years ago, uh, get, becoming more attuned to, and really started uh, speaking about just a little over a year ago. Uh, and I think since that time, it's kind of getting more and more on the public stage. And that's that as a technical community, we really need to be much more aware and talk about uh, what I refer to as tech clash, uh, a backlash against technology. Um, and we need to uh, be you know, both sensitive to public reactions to what we're doing, but also I think take our responsibilities much more seriously. So what I'm gonna do this morning is go through a few different areas uh, where I feel like uh, perhaps as a technical community, we haven't been as rigorous in our thinking uh, as uh, we would normally uh, wanna be. So, just to motivate this a bit, these are just examples, and you'll see these during the talk, of uh, some of the types of things that are getting people worried. Um, and uh, you know, this is you know whether it's fake news, whether it's um, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, this is without even going into privacy, right? So privacy, which is I think probably become a really big deal over the past few months. Uh, I'm not even going to actually touch during this talk. I'm just going to take it for granted that by now. You've been sensitized that the world's getting uncomfortable uh, with the way we as technologists have dealt with privacy. Um, and uh, you know, there's been actually a rising tide of pessimism. These are not new books, right? These uh, have been coming out, when I, mean, I say new, not in the past year, but they've been coming out over the past five to 10 years. Um, some colleagues uh, did, did a little bit of a search of uh, you know, just New York Times keywords to understand them. Just going to focus in on a few of the graphs. Uh, what you can see here is these, this is generally saying sort of what's the public discourse about some of these topics. And generally what you'd find is it was kind of bouncing around. It was sort of random. Uh, but starting a few years ago, some of these things started taking a disconcerting uptrend, uh, saying that the public is getting more concerned about them. So, for example, loss of control, right? See, it's starting to go up and to the right. And these numbers, by the way, are a few years out of date. So I'm pretty sure that if you, uh, we've actually asked the authors for updates on this, if you don't have them yet. Uh, but if you went and got the updates, you'd be finding that things like ethical concerns for AI, loss of control, negative concerns about the work environment, uh, and job loss, these would be going uh, significantly up since then. So we've moved from sort of uh, things bouncing around, a little bit of you know some angst and hand wringing, but generally okay to fairly steep up curves. Uh, and eventually, this is gonna kinda come back to bite us collectively. So just to sort of, as I said, I'm gonna go through a bunch of topics. Uh, one uh, is sustainability. You know, as we've uh, uh, been deploying more and more information technology, we're basically consuming more and more of the world's energy. Uh, now, having said that, it's actually a fair game because often what happens is uh, our computers consume a certain amount of energy uh, but actually are doing computations that are improving efficiency of, say, something in the physical world and generating an overall saving, right? So we might actually be generating a 3x saving, but society may be perceiving that we're consuming a larger fraction of the energy. So these are things that we need to work at, but we also can do a lot better. If you actually look at servers and data centers today, uh, you'd find that they are you know, very significantly underutilized. So there's a lot of headroom here for us to improve uh, the uh, utilization of servers and data centers and thereby reduce their carbon footprints. Now, at VMware, I'd say, you know, this is an area we're actually quite proud of because people that use our, our virtualization products, basically where they used to have, say, eight or 10 physical servers, uh, and in some cases, if it's desktop virtualization, it could be, you know, sort of 100 desktops, they've consolidated those down into a single server. So that's the good news. We feel like, okay, we've contributed a lot to uh, reducing the carbon footprint to data centers. Uh, but I will tell you that it's still the case that if you go look at enterprise data centers, there's a long way to go, right? And that's the data centers. Then there's the networks, there's our mobile devices. Uh, there's you know, kind of battery technologies that uh, uh, have a better long life cycle um, in terms of you know, how they might be recycled in the end, et cetera. So, Lots of room for improvement here. So generally, you're going to find with each of these topics, I'll give you the negative, but I'll also say, hey, it's, you know, the class is more than half full here. Um, 
So challenge here is, is, you know, I think, and what I'd like to encourage is, you know, more research, more activities saying, what can we do to improve sustainability? And this is beautiful stuff here because generally, improve efficiency and you've improved the carbon footprint, right? So it's a very much a win-win space. Okay, blockchain, um, in particular here, my first comments will be about the Bitcoin-oriented blockchain. Uh, you know, this is really in the category of who thought this was a good idea. Um, and the cryptocurrency, you know, some of the work is really very interesting and very elegant, and the idea of using proof of work on the surface sounds pretty good until you realize that proof of work is actually proof of wasted computation, right, which is proof of wasted energy. So, you know, just on the surface as engineers, that can't be a good idea, right? Um, and then you take a look and say, well, what is this being used for? And when you actually look at, other than speculation, what are the Bitcoins, who's actually using Bitcoins, it's generally being used for, you know, sort of criminal activity uh, of various sorts, whether it's money laundering or ransomware or other types of things, right? So, again, not particularly, a, you know, sort of a great contribution to society. Um, and, you know, the one thing that was supposed to be redeeming was the idea that it was decentralized, right, that, that this would be spread out, nobody would be in control, that was supposed to be the key feature, except that if you really take a look, you find that the miners conspire with each other. Uh, this chart, I realize you can't quite read it, but this is from uh, Are We Decentralized Yet? It's a site that tracks the different types of cryptocurrencies, and really, you know, they try to infer what number of different ind independent players are in control. So right now, Bitcoin, this actually improved. Usually Bitcoin's at four players. Right now it's at kind of five consortia, five groups that are conspiring with each other. So it looks like a large number of miners, but actually there's a, a lot of folks working together on, in this. Um, the other cryptocurrencies, generally a lot worse, right? So even the one thing that we said we were delivering as technologists isn't actually being delivered. Now, having said all that, again, I'm an optimist. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Um, so let's, you know, maybe we should throw the, the, the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin out, but let's keep the baby. Uh, so we're, we work, you know, at VMware, we're an you know, our customers are enterprises, so it's natural for us to say, hey, this idea of federated ledgers, this idea that underneath, put the cryptocurrency aside, the idea underneath that you have a decentralized ledger and that multiple organizations can work and they all have basically the same copy uh, and they all agree as to what happened, that's very, very powerful. So really what we think is going on here uh, is this notion of decentralized trust uh, and the ability for a group of organizations that, uh, that want to work together to find new ways to work together. Uh, and that's very cool. So there's, there's a lot of goodness to be preserved here. Um, the, the, this is a chart from the World Economic Forum's report. Uh, I won't go through them because you're probably aware. There's sort of people have discovered a lot of really interesting use cases in the supply chain space, in clearing financial clearinghouses, uh, in just publishing information, right? So, uh, and potentially in areas like identity, et cetera. So lots of great enterprise applications, lots of ways, again, that we as engineers can help contribute to improving society. Uh, but we need to create enterprise strength style ledgers. So I won't go through the details of this chart, but you know, sort of on the left hand side, you sort of see the properties of the Bitcoin ledger. On the right hand side, if you say, well, what would companies really want if we were designing this uh, to meet their requirements? Uh, and you see that actually the properties are very different. So for example, uh, they don't actually want anonymity um, because uh, it's very important when you're in business to know who you're doing business with, right? If I if I count on you to deliver something, we're part of a supply chain, I kind of know, need to know who I'm counting on because I need to be able to evaluate their reputation and their ability to actually deliver that good at the right time in the right place. Right? And that could be a financial product, it could be a physical good. Uh, and that's just one example. Now, I may want a lot of privacy. I may not want everybody else in the world to know that I did a deal with that particular party. Um, or how much volume of a particular product I'm buying, that can reveal a lot about my business, right? So interestingly, I want almost the opposite properties that the Bitcoin ledger provided, right? Uh, I don't want the anonymity, I want to know who the counterparties are, but I do want privacy. So we went through and, and looked at a lot of this, 
um, and you know, uh, have actually developed a uh, Byzantine fall tolerant based scalable uh, uh, consistency protocol. Um, we've actually put this out as an open source protocol. Again here, I'm not trying to sort of advertise, you, you can go read about our research, so I'm not trying to advertise the research as to say, on the positive side, uh, there is an alternative to proof of work. Uh, the the well-known alternative that people really understand well is Byzantine fault tolerance. Um, the catch is that at the time that work was done 20 years ago, people weren't really trying to scale it to hundreds of ledger replicas, right? They, they, actually, they thought four or five would be just great. So they didn't worry about things like n to the fourth n cubed communication costs. Um, the, just the fact that they could do it at all was pretty cool. Um, but we've really worked to get those communication costs down to make this thing scalable, uh, to show it can be geographically distributed. And by the way, the important thing about these graphs and any time you see graphs about uh, distributed ledger performance is how well does it perform in the presence of failures, right? Because the, the whole idea here of something being Byzantine fall tolerant is it works in the presence of failures, right? So if you only get the performance data when there are no failures, it's not, not really very useful. So uh, I think we've actually shown that we can do this kind of thing. So that's the, you know, the glass is, is half full here, uh, but we've got to sort of be careful because if we foist on society this thing, you know, that is, you know, just an enormous energy hog and doesn't even achieve the decentralization that it's advertised to achieve, the baby will get thrown out, right? So, um, by the way, th that uh, SBFT is available as an open source library, uh, Concord. You're uh, kind of very welcome to go play with it. So, you know, I think the challenge is here to get focused on the really great opportunity, which is to change how organizations and people work with each other, right? And there's just, and it can also be not just when I say organizations, so it's not just how companies work with each other and partner with each other, it can be how governments work with each other how companies work with governments. There's actually a chance to change the whole way audit and regulation work. Um, and you know, it, I'm gonna, it's hard to say audit and regulation are really exciting, um, but I've never really heard about people talking about reinventing audit or regulation, and that's the opportunity we have. Okay, so security. Uh, again, an area where the public at large is you know, getting pretty concerned. And forget about the public at large, I'm pretty concerned. Uh, I've certainly gotten you know, multiple of those letters saying, hey, your information's been lost uh, and is out there. Uh, some of you probably have too. Um, so you know, at, at a meta level, you know, I'm not gonna say I, I have the answer. What I'm gonna say is this is the path we've been going down. Again, you know, we, we sell to the world's enterprises. If you're running an enterprise company today, um, you basically have to have about a hundred different security products up and running in your organization, each of which is trying to deal with a particular type of threat. All right? So again, you know, who possibly thinks this is a good idea, right? Where essentially, the, and the way the research community is operating, and I'm part of that research community, but this is not okay, is instead of trying to you know, figure out systematic approaches, to solving the security problem, and there are a few people doing that, but a large chunk of the research community basically is in the mode of um, identify an exploit, go get a lot of publicity about the exploit, maybe write a paper about that so you get some academic credit, uh, go start a company, so this works actually for the VCs as well, it works really well for them, and then sell the company to some other large company who will sell it on to the enterprises. Right? So essentially, this is how we get this postage stamp. These are all the different products that are out there in the security space, and none of them solve the problem. They each just you know, put a little, little bit of a patch on uh, one particular exploit. So we need to really change how we're working. This is kind of how we're working today, uh, which is we're driving the people that run these security things into just reacting to these exploits. Uh, that's where they spend a huge amount of their money uh, instead of on systematic approaches to fixing the problem, uh, what you'd really like is systematic and preventative approaches. So we as a research and engineering community have to you know, get going on more systematic approaches. Something we've done at VMware is partnered with the NSF uh, on a particular program uh, that said, gee, you know, software-defined infrastructure and virtualization, these are techniques that have been known to work well for security because they provide good isolation. Um, and we, you know, we 
virtualized compute, we virtualize networking, we virtualize storage. Could that be the basis for really rethinking how we do security? So that's just one example, but what I'm saying is we're putting our money where our mouth is a little here in saying, let's try to come up with some more systematic approaches to attacking the security problem. Uh, so that's the, the challenge I'd like people to get into. Again, if we don't get into these things, we should expect the public to be really unhappy with us because the approach we're taking right now um, is perhaps enriching people you know, incrementally, but it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, and then we get to sort of AI and machine learning where there's a whole slew of things that are getting the public concerned. Now, one concern has to do with this notion that AI is going to take away all the jobs. Uh, there was actually a good, uh, you know, Krugman had actually a pretty good uh, article on this uh, in the New York Times the other day, so you may want to go take a look at it, uh, basically saying, no, it's not automation and robotics and AI that actually takes away the jobs. Um, and, you know, in fact, we know from past, you know, sort of experience with other changes that, uh, you know, we get these sorts of curves, and what these curves basically say is we get a new innovation, uh, the innovate, new innovation uh, basically makes something that was desirable affordable. That allows it to be sort of made in great abundance and made available to lots of people. When, when you hit the point in the curve where lots of people can afford the thing, uh, then a lot of jobs are created. And both the jobs in you know, creating the new good or service, are, you know, plus the people that are do, having those jobs start spending money, and so they create more jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of how our economy progresses. And you know, the good news is the analysts are now starting to counter the pessimists and say, hold it, you know, uh, actually, it's not necessarily such a concern. Uh, now, what, what I'd like to say is particularly right now with machine learning, um, we have AI and ML coming along as a major change in the workforce and in the workplace right at a time when we're facing actually a bit of a demographic crisis, right? Which is basically, this is the old age dependency ratio, which, you know, essentially says, uh, you know, for each younger person that's actually active in the workforce, how many people with gray hair like me are they going to have to support? And by the way, they're also going to have to support the people that are under 16 uh, and in school, et cetera. Uh, so what you see here is the old age dependency ratios are going up pretty much everywhere. Uh, they're uh, going up significantly. The top two curves are you know, in uh, Mediterranean Europe. Uh, then you have a couple curves representing the US. Uh, interestingly, uh, the, the curve actually, I don't know if you can see the light green, the curve that's going up the sharpest, that's China, right? And so they are actually going to be the first country that gets old before they get rich. This is going to be a, a real change in how kind of countries evolve economically. Um, and uh, then you, uh, you, know, you actually see that even India, the demographics are starting to change. So you know, essentially, if we didn't have a technology like machine learning coming along that presented us with the opportunity to dramatically improve productivity, we would be actually discussing not the loss of jobs, but oh my god, how are we going to keep the lights on? right? Uh, because we're not going to actually have enough workers. And that the really important discussions that we need to have, I'm not going to go through the unemployment rates here, but just say, are really what are the important jobs for human beings to do? And how do we get our workforce focused on the important jobs for human beings to do, where important includes also satisfying uh, to people in, you know, in various you know, kind of ways. Um, so worthwhile jobs. Um, one of the things, I don't have time to go through all the details here, but uh, I'll say is that one of the patterns you get is that when a new technology comes in and improves productivity, often it just pr improves productivity in some sectors, so the jobs get created in the low productivity sectors. But the low productivity sectors also end up being the low paying sectors. And it's always kind of the same sectors over and over. So something we really need to do if we want to change the dynamics of, of our society and how technology rolls out is figure out how to improve productivity in areas like government, health care. Uh, for some reason, rental and leasing is in there. I do not know why, but this is what the data says. Okay, But think of government, health care, education. These are three areas where we need to really figure out how to apply technology to improve productivity. 
because that's the sort of thing that's going to give us an overall productivity boost in our society. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, I won't go into uh, all the details of issues like wealth. It's really, you know, people often talk about wealth distribution. It's actually about wealth circulation, keeping the money moving around. Uh, we have other issues that need to be faced when you have something like a new technology like machine learning coming into the workplace. People are going to get displaced. Uh, we have to figure out how to do retraining and use new computing technologies and education technologies to make retraining work. And I'm going to tell you, it's not a pretty picture, right? Retraining uh, and reskilling of, of workers has not ever really worked in the past at scale, right? Uh, but notice from those demographic curves that we don't really have a choice as a society. We've got to make sure that every worker and every person that could be working is really productive if we want to continue with our standard of living. Okay, so turns out that's not the only area that people are concerned about. It's not just concerned about jobs. They're actually also concerned, uh, first off, that a small number of companies, maybe like just two or ten, are going to dominate this field completely. Um, and they're... Um, Concerned that, and this one really worries me, that we as engineers don't actually know how this stuff works. And they haven't really yet, uh, you know, society as a whole doesn't yet understand the degree to which we don't understand how this stuff works. When they figure that out, they are going to be really unhappy with us. Okay, so talking to that first issue, which is, you know, is something that we've been trying to address quite a bit at VMware, because again, our customers are pretty much every enterprise in the world now, every company medium and large company buys from us. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to figure out how, does, how do all these companies use machine learning as opposed to how is it used by just a couple of hyperscalers, right? So we understand that Google does a phenomenal job of using machine learning for targeting search and targeting ads. Uh, Facebook uses machine learning for social network graph, a few other companies. These are hyperscale companies uh, on hyperscale amounts of data, but how do we extend the benefits of machine learning to basically the, you know, everybody else? Um, and we've been working at this, but also a lot of universities have been working at this, and the key part of it is, if you think about it, there'll be a, a much stronger human element. In other words, uh, the world's you know, kind of enterprises as a whole, and this includes governments, deal with a much, much wider range of problems. So Google, Facebook, and a few others deal with a small number of problems at immense scale. Everybody else is going to deal with a very large number of problems at a pretty big scale. In other words, we want them to use a lot of data. It just won't be the scale of data that Google uses. And uh, so there's going to be a much stronger human element, a much stronger data analyst element, a uh, much stronger need for those companies to basically take advantage of their domain knowledge in whatever business area they're in. Um, and their data in order to generate benefits from machine learning. So my me message here basically is if you're doing research in AI or ML, you know, don't get you know, too sucked in and working on the two largest problems in the world because you know, basically Google's got people working on that already. Um, try to figure out how to disseminate you know, ML and get it used for a wide range of problems. Now, the other type of problem uh, that people are concerned about that we really need to talk about is this issue of explainability. And with explainability, with, with our, our you know, deploying and, and fielding technologies where we really don't understand how they work, means we also have the potential for bias to creep into the system. Right? So uh, these are issues that we've really got to work at. It's maybe OK if we don't understand how a cat photo recognition you know, software system works. right? Maybe it's OK. Uh, I'm, I'm not happy with it as an engineer. But it's not OK if we're doing this for a whole bunch of other societal important applications. It's not OK if healthcare is working this way. It's not OK if you know, uh, giving people or denying people credit is working this way. Right? Uh, and this is just something that we need to realize. So you know, when I talk about explainability, it's basically making sure that when, when we deploy a machine learning model, uh, we have some understanding of why it comes to the answers it does. We have some understanding of which inputs it will, you know, it will operate on, uh, which inputs we should not necessarily count on it to give us good answers for, uh, et cetera. And by the way, we should have some understanding as to how representative the data set that's been used to train the model is 
uh, because if that data set is biased, then you know, the model's gonna end up biased and the outputs will be biased. Um, and this, this is just sort of straightforward engineering, but we don't seem to be doing it. And uh, you know, if we don't do it, we should expect a little bit of a tech clash or a big tech clash. So just to drive this home as to sort of some of the risks here, um, if you have systems where we don't really understand how they work and we don't understand the circumstances under which they work, uh, then they're gonna be subject to adversarial attacks. Some of you may have seen these. These are drawn from other researchers. Here's a classic, you know, it's a photo recognition system. It sees this photo, it labels it as a dog. Okay. Your adversary adds a little bit of noise to the photo. You get something like this. Most people, still looks like a dog. ML system says ostrich, right? This is, kid you not, right? Okay, but here's another case where somebody doctors a stop sign by putting some uh, stickers on it, but they're cleverly placed, right? Adversary puts a few stickers on the stop sign, recognized as a speed limit sign. This is not a, you know, <laughs> this is not like a cat or dog photo issue. Uh, Here's another one. Uh, this is a little bit more of an active adversary. Uh, on the left-hand side, we've got sort of the car driving around a curve, and what you uh, may or may not have been able to see is that there was like a light that was causing a shadow on the road, okay? Now, the adversary actually, right where the shadow is, draws a couple extra black lines on the road. So it's not sort of obvious that they've tampered with it. These are not bright yellow lines, right? These are subtle, subtle change. So you, on the right-hand side at the top, if you look carefully, you see sort of what looks like two shadows. Here's what happens. Okay. Um, so now I'll see if I can advance. I'm stuck. Must be an adversary. Okay. So these are examples of adversarial tax. They're equivalent examples of bias, either bias in the data or bias in the model. Uh, and as I said before, these can significantly impact people's life. They can impact sentencing decisions, right? We could use machine learning to make sentencing decisions fairer and less biased, whether it's sentencing, you know, parole um, uh, or uh, bail decisions could be fairer and less biased. Or if we don't know how it works and we don't pay attention to the data, we may not even know that there's bias coming into them. Same thing with credit decisions, same thing with healthcare decisions. So this is stuff that we should be very cautious of voicing in the world. Now, on the positive side, uh, there are people working uh, very actively. DARPA has an active program on explainable AI. Okay, there are folks on the job trying to actually address the explainability issue. Uh, that's gonna take some time, but there's some things we can do and people are doing in the near term. So one is, Folks are actually working to get a better handle on the problem. There's a great team at Microsoft uh, Research uh, in their East Coast labs uh, that's actually working to get sort of a better handle on the state of the problem. This is not about how to fix it, but being able to analyze systems and understand what the risks are. Um, there, you know, Eric uh, Horvitz has sort of identified, I think, this issue that uh, if you train up a model on certain data, how do you know that it'll work well when you put it in the real world and exposed to different kinds of data? Uh, that's a great challenge. Um, there actually is some promising work there. This is actually work that one of our own researchers has done. There are others doing it as well on trying to verify the properties of neural networks. Now, doing this for deep neural networks in general, we don't know how to do, at least not yet. Um, but what Nina's been able to do is show that for a certain class of networks called uh, binarized neural networks, which means nodes in internal to the neural network generate binary quantities. Because those are binary quantities, we can actually kind of convert this into Boolean formulas. Uh, and then Nina turns out to be an expert on SAT solving. So we can actually now essentially exp you know, create a, a sort of whole system of constraints and prove properties of the neural network uh, that will tell us that for Example, two of the types of things that we can actually prove uh, about these, whoops. Uh, one is their robustness to, to permutation, to per perturbations. So I can, you can prove that if you only change the input a little bit, you won't get a dramatic change in the output, right? It won't just suddenly veer off in a different direction. Very useful to be able to, to, be able to prove that kind of property. 
The other thing is to prove that two models will generate the same results. This is hugely important to the life cycle of models because you're going to keep upgrading these things over time and you don't want the system to you know, work one way one day and completely different the next day. Right? So you want to be able to show that consistency over time. So lots of great work going on here. Um, I think another really important thing is don't go use something you don't understand if you don't get any benefit from it and if there's something that you do understand that works just as well. And what I mean by that is there's lots of cases where people are jumping on deep neural networks, using them, even though they don't actually have enough data to get any benefit with a deep neural network over using a more classical machine learning technique that's better understood. Right? So why are we doing that? OK, um, folks at IBM, I think, have done actually a very interesting job of generating a scorecard that you could imagine could come. So when somebody ships some machine learning software, voice it on the world, they provide a scorecard so people have some sense of its behavior. So again, you know, I'm not a pessimist. I'm trying to alert people to these issues and to this you know, kind of tech clash that I think we are bringing on ourselves. But I'm really an optimist about all the great things that we do with our technology, right? These are, are at their core, great technologies. I don't want to see babies get thrown out with the bathwater. Um, and I think that we do like just a ton of great things. As engineers, as researchers, we bring a lot of really great stuff to the world, things that improve people's lives in many ways, right? Their health, their joy, uh, you know, providing food to the world. This is all really great stuff. Uh, but what we have to realize is that we have a deal with society, right? And uh, the deal is that uh, they don't really understand how this stuff works, but they trust that we understand how this stuff works. And that means we can't get, you know, start foisting stuff on the world if we don't know how it works. We are perilously close to breaking our deal with society. We do that, we aren't going to be allowed to deliver all this great stuff to the world uh, that we've been doing and that I really love. So I'm just going to close with uh, sort of one, you know, nice calm scene uh, of uh, sort of one of my favorite places. I don't know if any of you recognize this. Uh, we're here in San Francisco. So this is a beautiful scene. You know, the only problem is that if you were at the other side of this water and you wanted to get to this side, um, it's really a uh, you know, terrible pain to, to do that. Uh, it turns out you'd have to go a, a tremendous distance uh, to be able to get there. This is actually, that body of water is actually the Golden Gate. Um, the Golden Gate isn't named for the bridge, it's actually named for the entrance to San Francisco Bay. And, you know, as engineers, we solved the problem, right? Uh, we built what I think is a beautiful bridge. Right? It creates this, this you know, great social benefit. People could cross from one side to the other. Um, it's harmonious with its surroundings. And we know how it works. Let's do more of that. Thank you.